Welcome to this lecture on Load Balancer and Oracle Cloud Infrastructure. So in this lecture, <coughs> we'll learn more about Oracle Cloud Infrastructure's Load Balancer SSL support. We'll also discuss some of the advanced topics such as session persistence and path-based routing. We'll also look at monitoring metrics and some troubleshooting guidelines. So a quick uh, recap of OCI's uh, Load Balancer service. Oracle Cloud Infrastructure Load Balancing Service provides an automated traffic distribution from one entry point into multiple backend servers in your virtual cloud network. So this helps to uh, load, balancer, uh, load, load balance large amounts of traffic, which otherwise could overwhelm a single server. Uh, it gives a mechanism to scale out an application tier by adding more servers. And it also provides application high availability. So even if one availability domain for some reason has an issue, uh, the application can still be up and running in a different availability domain. So Load Balancer uh, is a regional service. Uh, load Balancer comes in pairs. So we have active and passive. And Public Load Balancer lives in two separate availability domain, providing high availability uh, and no single point of failure. And the OCI Load Balancer supports TCP and the usual HTTP protocol as well as HTTP slash 2 and WebSocket, uh, supporting things like data compression, server push, uh, multiplexing of requests, and all of these features are supported. And for security, it supports uh, SSL offloading, SSL termination, and SSL end-to-end -end, uh, um, tunneling. So what are some of the key differentiators of Oracle Cloud Infrastructure Load Balancer service? Uh, so you can deploy the load balancer uh, as a public load balancer or a private load balancer. In a public load balancer, the load balancer has a public IP, thus it's facing the internet, and your backend servers are behind this load balancer. And we can also use the same service as a private load balancer, where the load balancer stays within OCI uh, between tiers, keeping it entirely private. So the other nice feature of the Oracle Cloud Infrastructure Load Balancer service is that you get a public a uh, dedicated public IP address. So you don't have to worry about uh, getting a C name uh, and dealing with that uh, to use this service. So the listener listens on the service port uh, on this IP address that is assigned to it and it's mapped to the user's OCI tenancy. So the third thing is that the load balancer comes in three different uh, shapes, uh, which basically provide different uh, levels of speed. So you have 100 meg, 400 meg, and 8 gig. So this uh, this throughput is for, uh, this is aggregate throughput. So the nice thing about uh, having this much capacity provision is that it's always available to the user. There is no warm-up period uh, when using this shape. And as I mentioned that this aggregate throughput performance is always available. And finally, there is a single load balancer that is uh, used for HTTP and TCP both. So this makes it uh, much easier to use in general. So now let's look at session persistence. So session persistent persistence uh, is a method to direct all requests originating from a single logical client to a single backend web server. And backend servers that use caching to improve performance or to enable login sessions or shopping carts can benefit from session persistence. So you enable session persistence when you create a load balancer or when you create a backend set. Uh, you can also edit existing backend set to enable, disable, or change the session persistence configuration. So OCI load balancer uh, service support session persistent, specifically the server-side cookie-driven uh, session persistence. And to achieve this, load balancer must be in HTTP mode. 
and session persistent is not enabled for clients that do not accept cookies. So the load balancer service offers two mutually exclusive cookie based uh, configurations for enabling session persistence. The first one is application cookie stickiness. And in this, the load balancer service calculates a hash of the configured cookie and other request parameters and sends that value to the client in a cookie. So the value stored in the cookie enables the service to route subsequent client requests to the correct backend server. Now, if your backend server change uh, backend servers change any of the defined cookies, the service recomputes a cookie value and resends it to the client. The second is the load balancer cookie stickiness. So when you configure load balancer cookie stickiness, the load balancer inserts a cookie into the response. The parameters configured within the cookie enable session stickiness. So this method is useful when you have application and web backend services that cannot generate their own cookies. So one key point here is that uh, until one of the backend server servers activates uh, session persistence, uh, the load balancer uses either round robin, least open con uh, connection, or any other method that is configured for load balancing. So what about fallback? So by default, the load balancing service directs traffic from a persistent session client to a different backend server when the original server is unavailable. Now you can configure the backend set to disable this fallback behavior. Uh, but, but just keep in mind that when you disable this fallback behavior, the load balancer will fail the request and return uh, HTTP 502 code. And the service continues to return uh, HTTP 502 until the client no longer presents or uh, presents a persistent, persistent session cookie. So as I mentioned before, uh, what happens uh, the, when the server becomes unavailable, the fallback method basically is controlled by the value that is set and load balancer can, uh, can pick up a different server from the backend set and redirect the sessions uh, to it. So how do we stop uh, persisting a session? Uh, the backend server must delete the session persistence cookie. So if you use the match all pattern, it must delete all cookies. And you can delete uh, cookies by sending a set uh, cookie response header with the past expiration date. And once uh, that is done, the load balancing service routes a subsequent request using the configured load balancing policy. Next, let's look at uh, request routing. So the load balancing service enables you to route incoming requests to various backend sets. And you can assign a virtual host name to a listener. You can create path route rules, or you can combine these traffics, uh, combine these techniques to route traffic. So virtual host names, uh, you can assign virtual host names to any listener that you create uh, in your load balancer. And each host name can then correspond to an application served from your backend server. Uh, some advantages of using virtual host name um, you know, are uh, basically are single associated IP address. So multiple host names backed by DNS entries can point to the same load balancer IP address. Secondly, a single load balancer. So you do not need a separate load balancer for each application. And then a single load balancer shape. So running multiple applications behind a single load balancer helps you manage the aggregate bandwidth demands and optimize utilization. Then simpler backend set management. So managing a set of backend servers under a single resource simplifies network configuration and administration. So you can define exact virtual host name, you know, for example, app.example.com, or you can use wildcard names. 
Now wildcard names will include an asterisk in place of the first or uh, last part of the name. So when uh, searching for a virtual host name, the service chooses the first matching variant in the following uh, order. The, and the order would be the exact name match, so no asterisk. Uh, for example, as we mentioned, app.example.com. Uh, and then longest wildcard name that begins with an asterisk, such as if you look at the same app.example.com, then it would be asterisk.example.com. So a couple more points that um, if a listener has no virtual host name specified, then that listener is the default for the assigned port. And then if all listeners on a port have virtual host name, the first virtual host name configured for that port serves as the default listener. Next, let's look at path routing. So some applications have multiple endpoints or content types. Each is distinguished by a unique <coughs> URI path. For example, you can have a slash admin, slash data, slash video, or slash CGI. So you can use path route rules to route traffic to the correct backend set without using multiple listeners or load balancers. So a path route is a string that the load balancing service matches against an incoming URI to determine the appropriate destination backend set. Now you cannot use asterisks in path route string, you cannot use regular expressions and path route string matching in case insensitive. So a path route rule um, basically consists of a path route string and a pattern match type. Uh, some examples of pattern match types include an exact match. So in this case, it looks for a path string that exactly matches, matches the incoming URI path. Then there is a force longest prefix match. In this case, it looks for the path string with the best longest match of the beginning portion of the incoming URI path. In prefix match, it looks for a path string that matches the beginning portion of the incoming URI path. Then we have suffix match. In this case, it looks for a path string that matches the ending portion of the incoming URI path. So path route rules apply only to HTTP and HTTPS requests, and they have no effect on TCP requests. You can specify up to 20 path route rules per path route set and you can have one path route set per listener. So in terms of uh, path, path, path based uh, routing priority, it goes with exact ma match first, then force longest prefix match, then prefix match or suffix match. So in case of exact match and force longest prefix match, the order of the rule within the path route set does not matter. Though if this matching uh, cascades down to prefix or suffix uh, matching, then the order of the rule does matter. So what if you have both of these uh, features enabled? In that case, hostname, hostname or DNS-based virtual host has higher priority than URI base route. So in this slide, we can see that we have a couple of virtual host rules and a couple of URI routes. So looking at an example of foo.com, that will get routed to backend set B, as can be seen on the table on the right. Or if you have bar.com, then that goes to backend set C. Now, in terms of URI, if you have slash base, it goes again to backend set B because it's an exact match. So now in this example, we can see we have three listeners. Uh, there is a default foo and bar. Um, there is a default backend set for default uh, listener-default is foo.bs.1. 
for listener dash full it's full four dot best dash one and for listener dash bar is bar dot best dash one now when we have um, a URL uh, example dot com it doesn't match any of the listeners thus it's routed to full dash best dash one which is the default backend set now when a URL with foo dot com comes in it gets matched to foo dash best dash one because it matches the server name server name foo dot com and the default backend set is foo dot best dash one now for the last two URLs bar dot com and bar dot com dash bas so when bar dot com dash bas comes in it matches the last listener which is bar dot com moreover we specify if it has a slash bas it should go to bar dot bar dash bas dash two which it does and in case of bar dot com the exact match um, is there there is no slash so it is default uh, it's routed to the default backend set which is bar dot bas dash one